I just want to um, welcome both of you and and uh, and introduce both of you to our online audience. Uh, Sultan Saud Al Qasimi and Bill Bregan, both um, in the in the UAE at the at the moment uh, and uh, during this COVID crisis and. It's exciting because I understand even though you live in the same region, you don't often have the opportunity to, to speak to one another. And so I'm very excited to welcome both of you to our Reimagine Global Conversations. And um, at this point, I think I would love to, to uh, shut off my screen and allow you two to, um, to get to know one another and to, and to talk about what's going on in your region. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Amir Ali. And maybe we can begin with um, Sultan. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, Amir Ali. Thank you so much to the Aga Khan Museum, our dear friends there. My relationship and friendship with the individuals and the institution goes back many years. We've curated an exhibition, but I've also known the staff members individually as well. So a big salute to everybody and thanks again. And thank you for putting me in touch with Bill Bregan, someone I admire. And I've known for years, but I don't know uh, as well as I'd like to. So this is a great opportunity now to have this conversation. Uh, Bill, it's such a pleasure to connect with you. And maybe we can begin with when we first met each other. Great, yes, well, it's such a pleasure. I was really, I was I was very excited when Amarali uh, reached out and uh, suggested not only that, uh, that I be a part of this conversation series, but that I would be paired with you, which was really an honor. So, uh, and I think it's, it's an honor, not only because of uh, what you've done and what you mean within the UAE, but also uh, quite personally, what uh, sort of what getting to know you has meant for my trajectory. So I've been here at the university for about five and a half years. Uh, I started in the fall of 2014, and I first encountered you, Sultan, uh, as I think many people in the world did via Twitter, uh, when, uh, when there was an announcement in the New York Times uh, announcing that I was leaving Lincoln Center and coming here. And you either retweeted it or, or just sent a little welcome text. And I was like, who is this person welcoming me? Let me check them out. <laughs> and then I immediately started to understand your, uh, your social media profile and uh, started kind of understanding the role that you've played uh, in the intellectual discourse of the country. And so I was super honored. We just followed each other. And then when I was, before I even moved here, I came for a visit to interview some people to work with me. I went to my office for the first time, took a photo of my door plaque and posted on Twitter. And within like five minutes, there was a note from you that said, welcome to the UAE. We should get together for, for dinner sometime. I'll show you around. And I thought, okay, you know, that doesn't really happen. Uh, and then uh, a few days later, you said, oh, I'm having a dinner party on Thursday night. Do you want to come? It was the night I was leaving to fly back to New York. I was flying out of Dubai. So I showed up at your house with my luggage like I was moving in. Uh, and I didn't know if it was like a personal, like just the two of us get to know each other. Or what <laughs> it was be. And the house was filled. And every single person I spoke to was incredibly interesting, incredibly. I could have spent the night talking to any one person I met. And that, to me, was just sort of the welcome to the world of Sultan al Kazami. Uh, just the, the way that you collect people and intellectuals and live in this world of ideas and connections. And, uh, and that was really, that was such an important entry into what it means as an outsider to come to the UAE. Well, let me reciprocate a little bit. So uh, the, I first followed you in September 2014, I believe. And uh, in October 2014, if I'm not mistaken, you came for dinner. And, uh, and I remember that dinner, we had a lot of interesting people in the arts and cultural uh, sphere. And I, I'm not sure if it was exactly that day or around that time where there was a, there's this um, instance, there's this photo that I have of us all huddled together uh, and you are showing us and introducing us to this performance piece uh, titled Indonesian Butter Dance with Adele 
<laughs> Do you remember that song? It was someone like you, one of, the, one of her hits, and someone dancing the butter dance. And I thought, this guy's really cool. <laughs> He's a lot of fun. So that was a lot of fun, Bill. But, but on a serious note, I, I must say that what I admired about you more than, more than anything, I think, is how you really deep dived into the culture of the UAE, uh, how it wasn't you just kind of coming into the UAE and bringing all this global culture that you were in touch with or even North American culture, but you, uh, you really deep dived into the culture of the region. I remember, you know, I just, did, I just went over your Instagram once again, just to refresh my memory of what you did. And within days and weeks of you being in the Emirates, you started going to see the local dances. Uh, the Razfa, the desert, the Bedouins, the, uh, the, the, local, the local performances that, that are still alive and not the ones that are elite, that are, done for, that are made for tourists, but the ones that are authentic. And I really appreciated this about you. And I thought, well, this is someone who's trying to internalize and trying to understand the culture of the country. And, and I see it, I see it over the past few years seep into so much of the work that you hosted at NYU. And I think that you really are, or you really were the perfect person for this, uh, this, this sort of uh, the, the art center, the art center that really brought Emirati, uh, Gulf, regional cultures, and sort of had this beautiful fusion with global culture. So I, I salute you for that, uh, Bill. Well, I'm, I'm, it's really moving to hear you articulate it like that. Uh, because I think it really speaks to and the reason that I came, the reason that I was attracted to this opportunity and the role that I want to play, uh, because I'm quite aware that I'm an outsider and that I'm coming in with my experience in New York and that experience was very much working in public spaces and civic spaces at Lincoln Center, at the Public Theater, at Central Park, and working with lots of different communities but in many of those cases, it is about those intersection points where different communities are coming together and having those moments of exchange. And for me, when I come here, it's, it's coming here with an openness and a curiosity and an eagerness to learn about the conversations that have been happening here long before I ever showed up. Uh, but also to think about the artists that I'm interested in often are entering into conversations about heritage and kind of and globalized culture and how do you balance that sort of that that tension between being really hyper locally rooted but also being in conversation with the rest of the world and i feel like what attracted me to the uae was the fact that that is such a conscious conversation as the uae is really investing in the in the cultural sector thinking about what does it mean to create sort of contemporary arts institutions, knowing that I was invited to be a part of that, to be a part of the Louvre Abu Dhabi opening and the Sheikh Zayed National Museum eventually, and the Guggenheim and Warehouse 421 and Dubai Opera and everything happening at Oscar Kyle Avenue and at your, your gallery at Virgil and Mariah Art Center and Georgia Art. And all of those conversations are, are often toggling between this how do we stay true to our heritage and who we are and not lose that, but also how can we benefit by putting our culture in dialogue? And the artists that I try to bring, I think are offering what their solutions were with the hope that now it's sort of offering more opportunities and, and a more possible answers to artists who are working right here. Um, you know, you, you alluded to what was happening here in the art scene, but even for someone like me, Bill, who's, I feel like I'm sort of plugged into the art scene here. I didn't know much even about the performance art in the UAE, the history of the performance art. And of course, what you've been doing, what your colleagues at the NYU Art Gallery have done, for example, with documenting the history of artists such as Hassan Sharif, whose performances in the desert go back almost four decades now, who must seem completely uh, you know, out of place for a society of the late 70s and early 1980s, UAE of him going to the desert, jumping and dancing, tying rocks into the, on the sand and uh, placing them there. This performance art that he initiated with Khalid al-Badur, with Najum al-Ghanim, uh, a person that you have also had 
a close relationship with and a friendship with, and you have brought her in to a lot of the uh, the, uh, the projects that you have um, initiated in the past few years. Am I right? Yeah, and I think um, we we've been lucky enough to show some of Mijun's films. Uh, through our Imagine Science Film Festival. She and I were uh, both on a, uh, a committee together curating poets for the Intima uh, exhibition at the NYU80 Art Gallery's project space that UAE Unlimited uh, sponsored. Uh, she was just part of an interview that we did for a, a performance that we're gonna be doing that will derive text for a choral piece coming from these interviews and she and I were paired together. And that was probably the most we ever really spoke. She's mm -hmm. come to plays that we presented, uh, Al Rahil, which was a new Emirati play that we uh, premiered. Uh, so she's been very much kind of in our world. Uh, and it was actually, I think, I'm glad that you mentioned the art gallery and the But We, we, but we Cannot See Them show that mm -hmm. Maya Allison curated because for me too, I think learning from Maya as my colleague and peer and dear friend, uh, that has helped me to really understand the contemporary art history or to begin to delve into it. And I think both she and I are really thinking about what it means for us both to be here, what is the existing practice that we're tapping into and hoping to activate further, how can we help you know, kind of draw from that continuum, add to the continuum, uh, and those moments of just being curious and learning, uh, but also I think coming to the exhibitions, you know, going to your house and having your curator show us through your personal collection and then seeing it reframed when, uh, when it was installed at the Sharjah Art Museum. All of those things really deepened my own understanding of, uh, of the kind of the, the stream that I've stepped into. I mean, in a way, you're very lucky that you came at a great time in the UAE's history. As you said, the opening of the Louvre, the opening of the Opera House. Uh, we've had recently in Abu Dhabi, the reopening of the Cultural Foundation, Warehouse 421, so many things happening in Sharjah and Dubai and elsewhere. So it's, you've really been, you really did uh, land here at, at, a, at a good time. But maybe I'd, I'd like to ask you, Bill, what were some of the surprises that, that you came across over the past five and a half years of you being in the UAE, the surprises that you encountered? Uh, you work in an educational institution. Uh, frankly, did you come across any red lines? Did you come across, did anyone tell you you can't do this or you can't do that? Did you have to, to, to skirt around the topic? Uh, as much as possible, could you share with us any, any instances of that? Yeah, I think that the, the thing that, that I come back to is uh, knowing that I don't know and not wanting to try to do something that's inappropriate or that is at the wrong time or that people aren't ready for. Uh, I look at my being here as part of the long-term process. Uh, the university, NYU Abu Dhabi, uh, now is 1,500 students, more or less. When I got here only five and a half years ago, it was 800, so it's grown dramatically. Our student body comes from 105 different countries, more or less. Uh, they're about 15% from the UAE. The US is about maybe 13, 14%, uh, and all the other communities are smaller. So there's no dominant majority. Uh, it is really totally transnational by design, and that is, I think, a reflection of the country as a whole. It's mm -hmm. extremely international, where there are people who are coming from major world capitals uh, that are totally secular. People are coming from major world capitals that are much more informed by their faith. People are coming from small towns. People have very different reference points. So for me, the biggest question is understanding that it is by far the most diverse audience that I've ever had to curate for, uh, that I want to meet people where they are. I want to bring them along. I want to enter into a conversation that is built on trust and not built on losing something, but also, you know, creating kind of new space that might not have existed until I got here. Uh, so for example, when I first when I first was looking at the job, I was told there was no contemporary dance, that uh, that there's traditional dance practices, mm -hmm. there was social dance practices, but that contemporary modern performance dance was not really something that was available and that potentially might uh, might approach people's discomfort with issues of modesty, issues of the body and so on. 
And so I really thought about that. And in my first season of presenting dance, I, in our first season, we presented three dance performances. Uh, they all happen to be solos. And if anybody knows contemporary dance, an hour long solo is not necessarily where you start somebody who's seen dance for the first time. But in one case, it was uh, it was a contemporary Bharatanatyam dance company that was based in the U.S. but with roots in South India, uh, and culturally it really connected. It was a single dancer. There was a live band on stage. It was gorgeous. You never felt the absence. We had a British uh, choreographer named Akasha Dedra, who worked a lot of interactive video that was designed at uh, Arts Electronica Future Lab in Austria, and it was about his own experience as someone with dyslexia. And mm -hmm. it was visually beautiful. He was wearing a suit. He was using the dance to also open up conversations about people's determination, which has increasingly become part of the public discourse, but it allowed us to have that conversation. And we had a, uh, a, a, a Taiwanese choreographer, Huang Yi, who had a piece, a duet with a manufacturing robot, Huang Yi and Kuka. And so mm -hmm. it dealt with robotics and technology and all kinds of other things. And all of those got an amazing response. So each year, I think we've opened up the dance programming. We presented uh, ensemble work by uh, a project called Badka, which the Katan Foundation uh, presented, which drew from Dabka, but also married it with contemporary dance. But we all had postmodern pioneers, the work of Trisha Brown and Merce Cunningham and Lucinda Child's dance company did the final performance ever of her Peace Dance, which was a collaboration with Saul LeWitt and Philip Glass. Uh, and they were sold out and amazingly well received. So I think it's because we have not, uh, we've not violated that trust, but we brought people along and, mm -hmm. and brought them into our world. I think that we've been able to grow. And to me, that's the best process. Bill, uh, I mean, what a beautiful answer. And I'm not surprised that people sort of, I feel like you eased people into this performance art. There was something that that was uh, not not completely new, but somewhat new. And it's still also NYU still being a new university for us here in the UAE. So I really feel like you handled it very well. But I wanted to ask you about uh, one of the performances that you had that involved someone Praying, uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? What was what was that about? Praying on stage. Yes. So that was uh, that was a play that we uh, we co commissioned. We were the lead commissioner, and then Cultural Foundation came on as a co commissioner called Oliver Hill Departure. It was by a young Emirati playwright named Reem Alwan Hali, uh, who is primarily a poet. She's a student here at NYUED, and she was working with Joanna Settle, who is now the head of our theater program. And she wanted to create a piece that was about uh, the lives of women in the UAE at various life stages, uh, about the way that, uh, that young women are navigating living between Arabic and English and how being bilingual changes their thought processes. Uh, they all are in various ways kind of you know, dealing with all of those issues that, that women in their early 20s are dealing with. It was a cast of four Emirati women, all college age, three who went here, one at ZU, uh, Zayed University. And uh, one of the pivotal moments of the show uh, came from their experience in the rehearsal room, where when they were on a break, the four, the four actors would sit on the floor together and they'd open up bags of snack chips and they would just <laughs> sit around and talk. And they were in English and Arabic and speaking in hybrids and less formal than the poetry that was in the show. And the director looked at that informal interaction, which was when people are not performing their identity, when people just mm -hmm. let their hair down. Mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. And that became a moment in the show for almost eight minutes when, uh, when they would improvise and ad lib. Uh, and the scene ends that you hear the call to prayer and as people do in real life, uh, the three of them went and started cleaning up the stage. And one member of the cast who's, uh, whose practice is more consistent in terms of observing the daily prayers, uh, she on stage went and, uh, and had a moment of prayer in sort of in full view of the audience because that's their reality. The sort of the fact that people have different relationships mm -hmm. to their religious practice and to their faith and that was a moment to capture it. And we were honestly not sure 
how that would be received to have something that is very personal and often very private in an audience that is mixed gender, that, uh, that there are many people who are not Muslim who are in there who don't usually witness people in sort of a private act of faith. Uh, and it was something that, uh, that we talked a lot about, but ultimately I think the feeling was this, this was their truth and we wanted people to portray their own truths on stage. Uh, I'm curious, from your standpoint, I think my experience when I first saw your collection was in its own way. A lot of the artwork that you collect, a lot of the artwork that you show in the gallery or at the museum, in also similar ways is sort of opening up conversations that may or may not, not often happen publicly. So I'm curious as someone who is, you know, is of here in a way that I'll never be, how do you navigate some of those questions about, is this appropriate to show? Is this appropriate to share? Uh, how do you go through that? You, you, you know, I'm a, I'm a bit of a, a cheeky person. I like to I like to poke. I like to provoke conversations, uh, and so yes, I like to always uh, make sure that we include individuals and uh, ethnic groups and minorities that are usually included in uh, in exhibitions that you would consider not only here but even internationally. Um, and in the spirit of our host today, the Aga Khan Museum who really sort of, um, uh, they manifest the idea of a, an inclusive entity. And I, again, I had the pleasure of visiting them in Toronto and trying to bring in everybody, people from different minorities and not necessarily Muslims, but people from different uh, 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 religious groups as well and non-religious groups, of course. So what we try to do, uh, Bill, is A, in our, in our exhibitions, I try to make sure that as many minorities as possible are included. And I want to reiterate, I am not a curator here, but what I do is uh, through, ac through acquiring works, I almost uh, give, I, I almost force my taste upon the curators. And so when you come and you borrow, when someone comes and borrows works from the collection, they will have to see works by Jewish artists. They will have to see works by minority uh, Arabs, whether they were Christian or or Baha'i or Kurd or uh, or Amazigh. And I, I don't want to forget mentioning any ethnic group, but uh, Armenian. I'm not sure if I mentioned Armenians, but so we try to make sure that these works are available and presenting them in all their beauty uh, basically encourage encourages people to borrow them and showcase them and showcase them as part of the heritage of the country as well. For instance, you know, we try to include as well performance art. We've done this in 2014. We've done this in 2020. Just January, we, ha we hosted a, uh, an American Jewish artist of Syrian origin about uh, to, to come and perform at an exhibition of Arab art. So it's very important for me to show that the, the Jewish community was an important segment of the, the region as a whole for decades, especially in the decades that pertain to our exhibition, which took place between 1950s and 80s, uh, or covers that part of the world. So yes, we try to include beautiful artworks, but we try to include the artworks with a, with a message. There's always a message. It could be political. It could be uh, uh, it could be social, it could be eth uh, ethnic, but I can't tell you how important it is to make sure that these individuals are included because Bill, uh, for someone uh, who lived in your beautiful city of New York, when we go, when I go to, to museums in the US, just to demonstrate that this is not only a Middle Eastern issue or a, a, a Global South issue, women work aren't represented enough work by uh, African, whether they're African-American or African artists, work by minorities aren't as represented. And so I feel like someone like me who has the ability to say, you know what, I'm going to make sure that our exhibitions are 50-50 uh, male, female. I'm going to make sure that we have Jewish artists always included. I'm going to make sure that we have artists from different uh, faith, faith and sects of Islam, Shia, uh, uh, Sunni, whatever I can do included in these exhibitions. So I hope, I mean, this is a long way to answer the, 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 your question, but I hope that is satisfactory. Yeah, no, I, and I'm, I'm glad you talked about some of those issues of balance and gender and representation, uh, because it is something that I thought a lot about uh, when I came here, uh, was since this kind of art center had existed, the question of whose stories are on stage and how does that impact who's in the audience and what does it mean to establish 
that to me was a paramount question and we're seeing it play out all across the world right now where people are challenging museums to say whose whose work is on your walls who is on your board who are who is on your staff who are your curators uh, and all of those questions are really live right now uh, i'm curious um Given that we've had this role reversal where uh, I came from working in New York and now I'm curating within the UAE and I've had to think about how do I, what do I take with me from my New York practice and what works here and what's different for this audience and you've done the opposite. When you're curating a show that you know or working with curators who are putting a show from your collection in London or in New York or kind of elsewhere, uh, how do you think about the translation from from one national context or city context to the other? Wow. Uh, okay. So um, what? So now my my collecting practice has kind of changed over the past. 17, 18 years since I started Bill. I started, I, may, I I used to like contemporary art much more than I do now. I still love it, but I feel like our story really is rooted in the modern 1940s, 50s. We need to make sure that these works are, uh, are safeguarded, they are preserved, they are restored. Uh, a lot of the contemporary arts, they have a lot of people uh, supporting them. So I'm looking at artists who practice in the mid 20th century. Uh, curating isn't, uh, I mean, uh, finally presenting the work isn't much different, although we have to make sure that these artworks, or we have to keep in mind that these artworks are also cultural ambassadors outside the region. So for instance, when I, when I, when we organize an exhibition in Tehran, let alone Paris, London, and New York, when we exhibit, when we organized the very first modern Arab art exhibition in Tehran, we had to make sure that the minorities of the Arab world were represented. We took Shia as well as uh, Jewish artists and Muslim and Christian artists. So that was one thing, as well as Emirati, Bahraini, Saudi, uh, uh, and Kuwaiti artists, because there's this sort of tug that's happening between Iran and the Gulf. And we want to make sure that we'll try at least to show that art can bridge this, these differences. And so the UAE has played a role here. The UAE has hosted a lot of Iranian artists, for example, uh, and I hope that Iran would host more artists from the Gulf, from the UAE and elsewhere. I think that's an important message. But taking the art to New York, taking the art to Paris and London, I think what I notice, and sometimes, Bill, I go and I just sit there and I just watch, I people watch. I sit for an hour and I people watch visitors go around the exhibitions because I like to see which works draw them. Of course, figurative, uh, figurative art draws them a lot because they see images that they can sometimes uh, um, relate to. But they also are surprised by, for example, the development of abstract art. And so that was very important for us to present. Or they see, well, for example, we took an exhibition to Singapore once and the works, they were very political. And so we even, we, uh, uh, and just seeing people's reactions to, uh, to the sophistication of art that emerges from the Gulf and the Middle East and the Arab world was very, very uh, uh, informative for me because I sort of, when I, when I look at it from the inside, I don't think of it, don't think of it as much. But uh, as long as we understand that uh, the, the audiences have to be treated with respect, I think this is what we have to keep in mind. Yeah, so I'm curious, as you're describing that, there's always a question about the function of art and how much art is instrumentalized and is, is the art art for its own sake or art for public good? So I'm curious how much that, uh, that affects the choices. Are you thinking about the impact that the art is going to have on the society in which it's presented? Wow, I think this this question I can turn I can easily turn it back uh, at you. But uh, yes, I do think that this is there's an important educational element. It's important, you know. Uh, last year, it's important to show this art for a number of reasons. I was thinking just last year when we decided that our exhibition is going to be 50 50 50 percent male, 50 percent female, because when you present an exhibition of 90 percent male artists, a young girl walking into the museum and, and, and looking at the work will come out with the wrong uh, message and say, Well, I can't become an artist because this is a male world. I can't, this is something that doesn't include me or if you're not showcasing artists of minorities, if you're not showing uh, individuals in paintings who have dark skin, for example, or individuals who are, um, I don't know, from different ethnic groups or, or, or religious groups, if you don't include them, then visitors don't see themselves in that. 
And I, I wonder, I want to turn this question back at you, and I want to ask you the same question. Uh, I, I ask that question to myself all the time. Uh, there's certain work that I, when I'm curating our seasons, the question for me is, why is it important that I bring this work here? What does it have to say? And sometimes those, the answer is a formal one. We want to present Merce Cunningham's work because he had monumental ideas about, uh, about ways of decentering the audience and about the kind of incorporation of chance and beautiful formal things. But often I'm thinking about what are the conversations that this artwork can open that, uh, that people really need to engage with. So for example, uh, and I think we have some images from it, a few years ago we presented a piece called Holocenes by mm -hmm. Lars Jan, an early morning opera. This was a piece of very hard to describe. It's an installation, a live art installation in a human size aquarium. And there are a series of performers doing everyday action. And while they're in there, the tank literally floods with 12 tons of water. And so, uh, it's very cinematic in a way because of the, the frame of the uh, of the tank. It looks like a human sculpture. It uh, it looks like dance, uh, and all of the pieces that are in it are open and enigmatic enough that you can impose your own interpretation. First and foremost, he's interested in opening a conversation through the artwork about climate change and about rising water levels. And in a, in a country like the UAE, where the climate can be so extreme, in a city like Abu Dhabi, which is built surrounded by water, the vulnerability uh, to climate change is really paramount. And it leads into all kinds of questions about war and conflict as people compete for resources that are resulting from drought. So the work there was in part designed to open up this conversation. It's also about an incredible feat of engineering. And then I found that the metaphors in the piece, uh, one of my favorite sections, there is a guy who's playing acoustic guitar and he's sitting on a chair and at some point the water rises so high, he's got to stand on the chair and then he's floating above it and he's holding onto the guitar like a life raft. Uh, and we presented it a week after the 2016 election, and we were being flooded with all of this news and all of this information. Uh, and to me, that became this powerful metaphor for how I personally hold on to art as my life raft during a difficult wow. time. Uh, and again, what is a function of art? And to me, that section, even in a piece that's about global warming and climate change, uh, was also about, uh, about how do we survive when we feel like we're drowning? Too much stress, too many Zoom calls, too, too much time at home, not being able to go out. And art is that, is that lifeline. So to me, that, that was the other, the other aspect I thought about. Bill, uh, usually there's, a lot, there's too much of things, except in this case, we have too little time. I want to say thank you so much, Bill, for agreeing to be my uh, co uh, co-discussant in this uh, in this uh, talk thank you so much for having us uh, to the Aga Khan uh, museum and uh, I couldn't have asked for a better partner in this project thank you so much yes it's such a pleasure and I'm grateful that the Aga Khan museum brought us together and hopefully we can continue this conversation even uh, even without their interceding uh, but thank you so much Sultan and thank you Omar Ali uh, Thank you to Alurka and everybody at the museum. Uh, I'm excited that friends in North America are also going to be able to have this insight into what's happening here as well. Well, it's been such a pleasure to listen to the both of you. I think the world is a much better place with leaders. I, I, I love the forward thinking, the, 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 the challenges, not only that you make to um, your colleagues, your peers, your audiences, but the challenges you seem to set for yourselves. Um, as as uh, as as leaders, uh, global leaders, and so it's been such a, a wonderful honor to to have you here with us, um, and I look forward to um, to hearing more uh, conversations between the two of you because I think some amazing things can happen as a result. So thank, thank you. you, thank you very much. much.